The name Shridat Ramphal is synonymous with Caribbean public service. A conversation with one of the most durable Caribbean public servants. Don't go anywhere. Carb Nation is up next. Welcome to Carb Nation, I'm David Hines, on location in Belize, in Belize City to be precise. It's always my pleasure to talk to people who make policy and make decisions at the highest level in our Caribbean society. And guess what, we've caught up with <laughs> Sir Shridat Ramphal, you must know that name, former uh, foreign minister of Guyana. Commonwealth Secretary General, Chairman of the Regional Negotiating Machinery <laughs> of the Caribbean, now facilitator, um, OS facilitator um, for Belize in relation to the Belize Guatemala um, territorial dispute. So, Sridhar Ramphal, welcome uh, to Caribbean. Thank you. Um, w what are you doing here in Belize? Well, indeed, I am here in Belize in an additional capacity. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm here as Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. Uh, but of course I can't be in Belize but be uh, talking with the government about the facilitation process. But essentially I'm here on something called a Chancellor's Forum, which is a project, an enterprise put together by Professor Nettleford, the Vice-Chancellor and I, uh, with a view to enhancing awareness throughout the Caribbean of the degree to which global issues impact on our lives and the lives of future generations of Caribbean people. Uh, in a context in which we, we suspect that there is not a sufficient awareness uh, of the degree to which that impact is, is, is pertinent. So I am talking with the uh, young people who attend the uh, Center for Continuing Studies of the University, uh, young undergraduates of the University of Belize. Uh, I'm talking with the private sector. I'm talking at a town hall meeting with the community, with the people of Belize, about these global issues. Mm -hmm. well, how important are those global issues to the Caribbean? Absolutely crucial. Oh, we are no longer, if ever we were, I don't think we ever were, uh, but we certainly are in no sense uh, outside the mainstream of international uh, happening. Nobody is anymore. We live in a, in a world which is patently one world, uh, interactive, interdependent. Uh, and the Caribbean, particularly with its uh, destiny bound up with serv facilities like services and tourism, financial services, uh, with its outreach to Africa, to Asia, uh, to Europe, out of its history, the Caribbean is part of that one world. And what is happening in that world is very vital to the future of the Caribbean. Um, let's go back to education. You're the Chancellor of the yeah. University of the West Indies. One of the criticisms um, that has been leveled at UWE was that is that the three campuses have now become sort of national campuses and kind of moving away from the pan-Caribbean mandate. Um, how do you respond to such a criticism? Well, I understand the criticism, first of all, because uh, one of the realities is that with three campuses, the, the students tend to be drawn too substantially from that country. Uh, this is not a matter of policy. This is just the reality of economics. Uh, it is easier, cheaper for Jamaicans in Jamaica to go to Mona. It is easier for Trinidadians in Trinidad to go to St. Augustine 
rather than to go to Mona and so on. But the net result of that is that it has changed the character of the campuses from what, say, Mona was 40 years ago, 50 years ago at the beginning, from a truly pan-Caribbean campus in which all West Indians had to go there if they were going to the UWI at all, uh, rather than have the option of, as it were, staying at home. Uh, so real is this that the then uh, Minister of Education of Barbados a few years ago, Mia Motley, actually proposed to the university in its council and had it adopted uh, that as a matter of policy, Caribbean countries and the university must work out a system in which every UV undergraduate spends at least one semester in the three years in a country other than its home country, in a, in a campus country of the region other than its home country. So the criticism is valid, uh, the reality is understood, uh, the university is attempting uh, to overcome it. Mm -hmm. let's, let's move to Belize and, and talk a little bit about that process. Yeah. Um, there's been uh, what I would call a lot of swift movement, certainly after years of hard work. Yes, Over right. the last two years or so, we've yes. seen a rapid movement. Tell us where that is and um, your own view on how um, it will end up. Well, I think it's a tremendous story in conflict re resolution, for which many people must take credit. Uh, Certainly the OAS, as the regional hemispheric organization, deserves a great deal of credit for, if you like, bringing the facilitation process, the, the conflict resolution process, under its canopy, uh, and therefore elevating it uh, to a higher level of urgency in terms of solutions. I think another factor of success was the innovation of its not being a negotiation between the two parties, but between facilitators on their behalf. Now, I was the facilitator for Belize. Uh, and because of that one remove resolution process, uh, it was possible for us to make greater progress uh, than if the parties were confronting each other on each occasion getting annoyed with each other, breaking off the negotiations, having to start up again, and so on. The facilitators uh, were interposed, as it were, uh, between them. Uh, and the result was, as you say, pretty rapid progress in, in a two-year period. It's not over, but we have reached initial agreement on proposals uh, that are before both governments, uh, and that have been negotiated through a process which involves the governments uh, and which now have to be ratified by referenda in both countries. Uh, Belize has just had a national election. Uh, the government has been returned. That was in some kind of way a, a referendum process, but they have to have a proper referendum. Uh, Guatemala is having an election later this year and so can't get the referendum mixed up with the election but we'll have to have uh, a referendum process too. But meanwhile, the OAS uh, is in the process of establishing a presence uh, on the border between the two countries and what uh, we have described in the, in the proposals as the border between Belize and Guatemala, which is substantially the line for which Belize has contended. Uh, there will be an OAS presence on that line uh, until the whole referendum process is worked out. Uh, so I think for practical purposes, uh, in terms of Belize, but I believe ultimately in terms of both countries, uh, the process has already advanced the resolution of that conflict to a point of determination. Why do you think the settlement of this problem um, is so important for a country like Belize? Well, it is absolutely vital because uh, an active territorial controversy involving your land is a controversy involving your, your national integrity. Uh, it is not limited to Belize and Guatemala. Uh, it, it is very valid, very active in relation to Guyana and Venezuela. Uh, 
uh, and there are rumblings with Venezuela in other contexts in, in the Caribbean. Uh, what it does is to divert human and financial resources from development to, in some cases, defense. Mm -hmm. uh, that has happened with both Guyana and, and Belize. Uh, so anything which takes you away from that conflict removes a border quarrel from the agenda allows you to devote your full attention, full resources to the real problems of development. Mm -hmm. You are nationalist in the sense that you um, uh, serve the Guyana yeah. um, in, in public life. You're an internationalist. You serve um, in, in the Commonwealth and other um, international organizations. But above and beyond all of that, I think that you are a regionalist. Um, and so I, I, I want us to talk well, about that. Right? <laughs> I, 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 I like the definition. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about where the Caribbean region yeah. is at the moment as it faces the globalization that you've been talking about. Um, one of the things that um, face the Caribbean now is the whole question of free trade, the common and stream of the free trade of the Americans. And I know you've been involved in trying to work out yeah. a good deal for the Caribbean. Talk a little bit about the free trade of America, what really it sets out to do, and how that impacts on the Caribbean um, negatively and positively. Well, what it sets out to do was not essentially of Caribbean making. It was an American project mm -hmm. uh, under President Clinton. And what it set out to do was to apply the philosophy of the WTO to the hemisphere in a WTO plus context. Uh, a free trade area of the Americas is in a sense an extension to the whole hemisphere of the NAFTA context, of the Naf NAFTA concept that brought Mexico and Canada into a free trade area arrangement with the United States. Now we're talking about a pan-American uh, free trade area. Uh, now Canada and Mexico is, represent one kind of arrangement. They're very, very different countries and economic circumstances of the whole of the Americas is quite another story. And for the Caribbean, where the issue of inequality between our small economies and small populations and vast countries like the United States and Canada and Mexico and Brazil is so stupendous that it is not just a matter of quantitative difference. It involves a qualitative change. And we have to therefore be very innovative. We have to be very careful that what works for Mexico and Canada and maybe for Brazil can be made to work for the Caribbean. But it won't work for the Caribbean unless it undergoes transformation and adjustment. And therefore for us, negotiation of an FTAA is a much harder task involves much deeper strategizing and reasoning and argumentation and analysis than it does for countries that can approach parity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one of the criticisms of the Caribbean in the past, um, and I suppose recently, is the whole question of the Caribbean maintaining a common stance um, continuously on these issues. We've had instances where some countries have gone off and done their own thing, have um, negotiated unilaterally. How do you respond to that criticism and how do you think we can overcome it? It is a Caribbean curse. It is a plague. It's a scourge uh, of regional integration. Uh, it is a battle that we have constantly to fight and must ultimately overcome. But you know, we are not alone in this kind of visitation. Europe 
for all its centuries and, and for all its tremendous strides towards unity is plagued with the same kind of malaise at this very moment Europe is divided bitterly badly uh, and yet as Europe will I am certain find its unity again so the Caribbean has managed despite these vicissitudes to find a large commonality uh, a large area of unity which keeps them together in fact I believe that today the Caribbean is at a high point of unity it will never be complete so long as our political arrangements leave us less than united because the pressures of national existence of national government national politics uh, will exert its own pressures uh, and lead from time to time to countries seeming to be out of step but bringing them back in step remaining West Indian is something we have managed to do and I think we always will Recently, the last meeting in Trinidad and Tobago, the whole question of political unity raised its heads yeah. once again. Yeah. Um, why do you think it came up as an issue at this particular juncture? And oh, are you optimistic about it? Well, I think it is very significant that it came up again. Because what is happening is that from time to time, the compulsions of unity are exerting themselves are imposing themselves on rational thinking and so here you had a new prime minister in office in Trinidad and Tobago looking at the regional situation and coming to the conclusion which others had come to and gone away from over the years that we've got to face this question of political unity uh, and we, the sooner we do it the better and let's, let's, let's be ready as Trinidad and Tobago to go with whoever is ready to come with us that kind of thing uh, so that discussion in Trinidad and Tobago is very important I was very honored to have been invited by Prime Minister Manning to attend it as an old timer uh, in, in this battle uh, and the very fact that it has happened whatever the outcome may be must be a sign of hope for people like me and I know there are many like me throughout the Caribbean and West Indians abroad uh, who believe that the ultimate future for the Caribbean must be uh, Caribbean nationhood and certainly when you served on the West Indian Commission it was one of the sentiments that was eloquent absolutely expressed absolutely and very strongly in the diaspora. Exactly, exactly. Um, you, you spoke about Europe um, just now, and um, certainly Europe in the past, certainly since independence, took a different approach to aid um, to the Caribbean, how it dealt with the Caribbean, um, in terms of preferences and so on and so forth. Recently, Europe itself has been undergoing some transformation brought on, of course, by European unity and, of course, the WTO. Bring us up to date on where they are in terms of um, dealing with the Caribbean at this point in time. You know, preferences um, are going away and yeah. so on. Well, I think the Caribbean has gone far down uh, in the European agenda, partly because Europe is itself changed and is changing even more as it admits new members. Uh, the period of which you spoke which saw the early days of the Lome Convention, special preferences for bananas, for sugar, matters of that kind, was a time when our relationships were essentially with Britain and through Britain with Europe. Mm -hmm. That time is changing as Europe has moved from community to union and where the relationship is less with Britain than with Europe as a whole and that Europe as a whole does not have a sense of commitment to the Caribbean 
uh, and the, the Europe of the future will have even less. So I believe that we, we face very new and very challenging problems uh, with Europe. There are many voices in Europe which, take, which, which, which assert that why should we really be involved in the Caribbean? That's the, the American sphere of influence. Let the U United States take care of that. Well, that's not very good for us because what we, we don't want a new form of colonialism. We don't want an American hegemony. Uh, and that is what that kind of European attitude would push us toward. We want good relations with the United States, relations built on self-respect uh, and built on the confidence of genuine aid and assistance in a hemispheric context. Uh, so I think our future uh, is going to lie very substantially within the hemisphere and within the world and less with Europe as part of that world. Mm -hmm. Without divulging my sources, I know that you um, do give advice to a number of governments across the region, um, and we, we come from the same country, and I, I know that you feature um, uh, somewhat there in terms of um, advice. What concrete advice would you give to Caribbean leaders, um, Caribbean political leaders, at this particular juncture, when um, we have going away, uh, preferences are going away, the United States is going to become an even more formidable force after the end of this conflict, what concrete advice you would give to them? Well, first of all, to be true to ourselves. And to be true to ourselves means maximizing our identity. Our identity is our unity. Our unity is our identity. Never moving away from our oneness, which is the, the grand norm uh, of the Caribbean reality. It is when you move away from that that you begin to get into difficulty. Clinging together to each other in a very real way. And that means a whole variety of things. It means deepening Caribbean integration. It means making a reality of the single market an economy. It means abandoning chauvinism. It, it, it means giving up notions of Antiguans being strangers in Trinidad and Trinidadians being foreigners in Jamaica. It means that all those barriers which are much more barriers in the mind than at the ports or the airports must come down and Caribbean leaders must give leadership to the community at the policy level. I am convinced that Caribbean people see themselves as one people, that they want larger and larger measures of unity and that they will take the lead and give support to leaders who assert that that is the direction we will go. But if a political leadership takes an all too easy kind of political chauvinist kind of position, then populations will tend to follow behind that kind of sentiment for a time. Mm -hmm. So there is a tremendous burden of responsibility on the political leadership to remain faithful to what I believe is the Caribbean destiny of nationhood. You, from all accounts, could have been a successful attorney at law, yes. yet you chose public service yes. um, um, for 40 years, or there about, 30 odd years. Yes. Why and what satisfaction have you gotten from well, great satisfaction, great intellectual satisfaction, a great satisfaction in terms of a sense of trying to move my Caribbean in a way which will allow me to say to my grandchildren, I tried. I tried to create a future for you which is better than what it has been 
in the past. I've had tremendous personal satisfaction. You don't make a lot of money outside of that uh, in, in public life, but there is nothing that could buy the quality of satisfaction uh, that helping to nudge things like this along will do. Mm -hmm. Our audience is uh, mainly uh, uh, the Caribbean diaspora in North America, in the United States of um, America in particular. What message, pointed message, you have for them? I would say to them, stay with us. As I would say to us, stay with the diaspora. That was the message, after all, that came out of the West Indian Commission exercise. We need the diaspora. We, we need it in tangible ways. Those remittances are very important to Caribbean economies. But much more important than that is that we need their strength, their solidarity. We need their voice sometimes in the councils of decision making in the United States uh, to say, perhaps helping the Black Caucus to say, now hold on, the Caribbean is a part of a very special relationship with the United States and must not be jeopardized. And with that special message, Caribbean public servant, so Sri Dat Ramphal, it's been a pleasure. To great, with you. great pleasure to see. You. Well, I hope so Sri Dat's conversation with me has been most informative to you viewers. Until the next time, this is David Hines thanking you for tuning in to yet another edition of Carb Nation. And remember, as always, our motto is: One people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation.